Good evening, and thanks for joining tonight's TI Technology Webinar, hosted by Text Instruments, where tonight we're so excited to bring to you the brand new TI Inspire CX2 Online Calculator. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make those tough to teach, tough to learn concepts accessible to all my students. With us tonight, I'm excited to be joined by Ed Depot and Adam Pinnell. Ed is the Director of Mathematics for Region 19 in Northeast Connecticut and has his doctorate in math education from Teachers College at Columbia University. In his 21 years of teaching, he has experience in K through 12 and post-secondary mathematics education. He enjoys the outdoors and sports with his wife and two children. So Ed, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me, Mike. I'm excited to be here with everyone. And Adam received his undergraduate degree from UNC and completed his PhD in mathematics at North Carolina State University. He taught for three years at Bluefield College and spent the last 24 years of teaching at Greensboro College. He's a TQ national instructor and loves exploring new ways to help students learn. When Adam's not teaching, he enjoys spending time with his wife and son. He's been married to his wife, Janet, for 31 years, and his son is 13. So, Adam, it's great to have you with us as well. Thank you. Um, looking forward to this. Ed, would you mind getting things started tonight and uh, oh. talk us through what we're going to do tonight? <laughs> that sounds that sounds great, Mike. Well, you did our welcome and introduction, so appreciate that. Um, very first thing we're going to do is really just introduce the online calculator. We'll go through how you get logged in. Uh, we'll explore the page, what it looks like. Um, and after that, we'll dive in a little bit deeper and take a look at what is the, the calculator page, those apps, the graph pages look like on the online version versus the handheld. Uh, then we're going to go to modeling uh, an area activity. So some geometry. After that, we'll go ahead and take a look at uh, a probability counting activity using Python. And then we'll take a brief tour of math inspired on the education TI website. Um, and then we're really excited um, that anybody that stays through the, the whole webinar at the end, we're going to do a drawing uh, and those that are here will get entered into a chance to win a TI calculator of their choice. Very exciting. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ed. And Adam, we talked through uh, our expected outcomes for tonight. Sure. Um, yeah. And we're really hoping we didn't have to bribe you with the drawing to actually get you to stay for the whole time. We'll try to make this interesting, but anyhow, um, what we're hoping is you finish this, that you can say that you understand the different pages of that you can access on the online inspire. Um, we hope that you can use the online inspire, um, to help your engage your students with the math and. Then we'll also show you, and so we hope you can find activities for your classes used with the um, TI Inspire technology. And we hope you have fun while we go through it too, but that's an expected outcome that's not written. Thanks so much, Adam. Ed, you should have control. Feel free to share your screen. All right, let's go ahead. I'm first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and share my screen here and you all should be seeing my Chrome browser. Um, so the TI Inspire CX2 online calculator works through Chrome. Um, so if you pull up a Google Chrome browser and go to inspire CX. .com, or if you just type in inspire CX and the digit two dot .com, you'll get there both ways. And you'll see this online page here. It looks like this. You know, you're at that online calculator. We'll go ahead and press sign in. You'll get your, um, sign in credentials through Google or through an email. I'm going to go ahead and sign in through Google. I'll select the right Google account that my subscription is associated with. And this is the very first page I always get to see. It's open up a new document from a computer. Uh, excuse me, not a new one, a, a pre-created one, or you can create your own new document. Um, and so what I thought we'd do today is in our agenda, you saw we're going to explore that, what it looks like the very first time. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new document, all right? And it, it'll pull up here just like this every time. So you're gonna see all the way over here on the left, about five icons. We'll go through each of those in a minute. 
you're going to see your TI Inspire CX2 keypad on the left split from the screen of the handheld. Uh, we have all our options here. You're noticing those apps you're familiar with from the handheld. But if we scroll back to the left here and take a look at document, all right, that first icon, that's where you can see you can open up a new document. Uh, you can open one from your computer. And this is also where we're going to save to the computer. So unlike on the handheld where you save to the handheld, this is an online browser, right, that we're running this uh, online calculator through. And so we're going to save directly to the computer. So anytime we want to save, this is where we're going to do that. Uh, the next icon below that, press escape, get out of there. We see large screen. Let's see what happens when we click that atom. That's where we get our handheld. So it goes right to that large view, put together, no longer split. If I click it again, it goes right back to the original default view we had. Uh, just below that is screen capture. So if I want to take a screen capture, I'll click that. Uh, the next thing we'll do is go over here to the, the window that pops open, capture screen. And you'll see it's going to take a screen capture of the handheld screen, not of your computer, but of that handheld. Uh, we can copy that. So if I press copy, any image I have, this is not necessarily one I would want to do this with, but I can open up a Google document, Word document, and go ahead and just paste that right in there. And you'll see you can do whatever you want with that, that image and a document. Coming back to our online calculator, we can also download this image. Press download. It's going to save it right to my default folder. Um, so let's continue on looking at these icons here on the left. We have the screen capture. The next thing is connectivity. So I'm going to go ahead and select connectivity and we get launch TI Inspire CX to connect. So I go ahead and press that. And you're going to get this new tab that opens up. It says, let's connect to your handheld. All right. So I'm going to press connect. And what it'll do is it'll go to any calculator you have connected. To your device so i'm going to go ahead and select that first one press connect and you'll see these options come up every time you have a screen capture here as well so now we're going to capture from not the online calculator but our handheld device we can easily transfer files from the online calculator from the computer uh, right to our handheld and back and forth and then the last thing really easy to do Everyone is, if you click that, get updated, it'll update your handheld very quickly. Um, so TI Inspire CX2 Connect, great, great feature through this online software. All right, then the last icon we have here is our help. There is an online help tutorial. We have resources that come through with this. And then the last one are about, about it tells us the build that we have, which one we're working off of, things like that. All right. So one more thing I can mention here is in our top right here, there's an icon here. It's got a little uh, profile. If you click that, it's going to tell you what um, your account information is. It's also where you can sign out. So I found that when I'm signed into a browser, I'm using this, I might go home and want to sign into another one. Uh, if you have too many signed in browsers where you're using the online calculator, it's not going to allow you at some point to, to continue to use that one. So you want to make sure you're signed out if you're not using it um, so you don't run into any options. Yeah. Yeah. Quick, quick question. I put a um, website on there because for the website and Mike said it didn't work. So what did you use for to get onto the Inspire uh, online? Yeah, so I'm just using N. Spire cxii.ti.com. Okay. <clears throat> and it should so, also work if you do inspire cx and then the digit two at ti.com. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So um without further ado, let's dive into some of our favorite apps here. So um Let's just start with a calculator page. So I'm gonna go ahead and one way to do that is you'll see here, it's defaulted to, uh, close out our screen capture there. The very first one that comes up is just adding any one of these apps. You can also press this insert, right? That's another way this insert gives you all those same apps we see over here on the right, but we can start with a problem versus a page. And then just like you did on the handheld, if you do control doc, you're gonna get 
all these options as well. So lots of different ways on the online software to go ahead and get the same thing done. All right, so often what I what, what I do with my students is we're, we're exploring adding fractions. They've forgotten how to add uh, fractions, might add the numerators and the denominators. So I'll quickly go through with them on the Inspire. Um, how, does it, how does adding fractions work? So let's go ahead and press control. I'm using my keypad, just using my touchpad over here and pressing on the CI, CI Inspire CX2 control and then divide. We get that fraction template. Um, you can use the keypad over here to type in your numbers or you can just use the keyboard on your device. We'll do a half plus three quarters. And we quickly see it's five fourths. I would have a conversation with the students. Well, how did we get that? Um, so again, the point here is that what you did on the handheld, you can very much do on the software as well. Uh, let's go ahead and do a very common one that comes up is the quadratic formula. Love using this template here, especially when you can copy and paste and work quickly, getting multiple solutions. We'll get the square root of, so we're doing the opposite of B plus the square root of B squared. We're gonna subtract four by A. A in this case is one. And C is gonna be five. I can put my multiplication here. So I'm just going back um, using my cursor and I can insert a multiplication in there. We'll go to the denominator and we're gonna do two multiplied by A, which in this case was one, right? I'm gonna press return or enter on your keypad here. And there's our first solution. Um, so let's go ahead and store that. It's a common thing we will do is store this to a variable. And in this case, let's do X one. So you'll see I'm, I'm kind of going back and forth between using my keyboard and also using the keypad here, showing they both work uh, in the same way. So now that's stored to X1. Uh, what I used to love to do on the handheld atom in this case is kind of scroll up. We can still do that. I'm pressing the up arrow on my, my keyboard. It's highlighted that uh, entry. And if I just press return, it's uh, copied and pasted it down there for me. The other thing you could do is just use your, your mouse and scroll up to where you wanna be, copy just like that, highlight it, and do a control C and a control V. Uh, it's an additional way you can do that. We're gonna go ahead and edit this to be a minus and get our other solution. And let's go ahead and store that one to X2. All right, so now we have uh, our first X values stored to X1, our second one to X2. Um, if we recall those, maybe a common standardized uh, test question would say, hey, what's the product of the solutions of this equation, right? So let's go ahead and take the product of those. And we see that's five, all right? So a lot of the, th the things you did on the handout, we can still do here on our software. All right, let's go ahead and explore the menus in the calculator page. So when I press menu on our Inspire keypad, we get all the same menu options we had before. Actions, number, um, we have some algebra, our calculus, probability, our statistics, all these still exist right here. Um, so let's go ahead and go back up to number and let's find a least common multiple of say three and four. So we'll do three comma four, get 12, um, exploring some more in the, the menu options, um, algebra numerical solve. So oftentimes uh, we wanna know what capability this technology has. So if you wanna know, hey, students can solve numerically equations, meaning um, if we type an equation like 2x plus 3 equals, using an equal button, 5, and we're going to say solve this equation for x, go ahead and press return, it'll return the solution for that. All right. Um, 
some other things I, I have students do in geometry class, they'll use the area formula. So we have um, all our, our features over here, but I can also just type in pi using my keyboard and students quickly realize, hey, that's, that's a quick way I can get pi in here. Let's multiply that by the radius squared of a circle. So we'll assume the radius is five. Go ahead and square that and it'll return a value. So going back and forth between using our keypad and our keyboard, you kind of see a little bit of the, the online calculator here. All right, let's go ahead. What do you think, Adam? Is it time to explore a graphs page? Sure. All right, so again, we can use this plus insert, right? That's kind of a new feature, so I'll highlight that. And let's go ahead and add a graphs page. And the first thing you see is graphs looks just like it does on the handheld. It opens up with the function window. You also see the graph below. All right, so we might start with entering um, f1 of x. Let's just do a linear function to start off. And we have 3x minus 8. When I press enter, and it'll default the very first function you enter in blue. We get the function name. If I take my, my cursor of my mouse or my touchpad and I move along the line, you get that recycle kind of rotating symbol for your mouse. And then moving towards the center of that portion of the line, you get the crosshairs. So I can grab and move this around just like I would on the handheld. And the way to do that is I'm working off a touchpad just like my students. I would click down on my touchpad and hold that. And you can see it's translating that line. As it does, the notation changes. Right? I'm seeing my y-intercept value change. All right. If I wasn't happy with what I did there, I can undo that. So let's go ahead up to the top here again. And you see the arrows pointing back and an arrow pointing forward. I can undo and I'll go right back to where I was. Redo. We'll redo what I have there. Um, yeah, so a couple of great features, really easy to do on the online software. All right. Uh, if I want to change the attributes of this line, if I just press uh, or hover over that line and a right click for me, I'm working off my MacBook tonight. I'm just going to do control click. That's going to be my right click. Um, and you'll see a menu pop open. We have attributes. Right, that's where we can change the thickness of the line if you want it dashed. Uh, but if I want to change the color, I can go down here to color, change that to line color, and we can put a brown on. Now our line and our function label change colors. Um, so lots of things that you could do on the handheld, still being able to do here on the online software. Um, Let's add another function here. And the way I would do that in the handheld is pressing tab. I'm going to press tab on my, my keypad and our keyboard, excuse me. And our function window, it'll default to F2 now because we have a function in F1. And we could put a quadratic in there. So I'm going to do a quarter multiplied by X squared. And we'll subtract 7 from that. All right, so our parabola is going to be opening up. It's shifted down seven units, and it's going to be a little bit wider here. Let's go ahead and press Enter. And purposely tried to find one that would not fit here in the window, because what I love, love about Inspire the handheld, or even here again on the online version, is you can go ahead and click. We can do the menu window option, but this feature here, just clicking on one of the axis end values. Click twice there and it'll open up and we can change those values. So let me change this to eight. If I press tab, it's gonna go down to the next one. It's gonna kind of rotate around clockwise. I definitely wanna see lower. So it's helping me to build this idea of the window while looking visually at it. I can tell they intersect below here. So as a student, I'm thinking I should enter a value that's a little bit lower than what I have now. Maybe say negative 10. Pressing tab again, moving around. Oh yeah, I see a little bit more of my window. Let's go ahead and go to our upper axis end value, pressing tab till I get there. And I wanna see a little bit higher. Let's say maybe 15. Pressing tab, oh, that's not quite enough. And I still, my eights 
you're going to go a little bit more to the right. So maybe we'll, we'll increase that a lot more at 20. And I can keep doing this until I get a, a picture that I really want to see. Um, so I still need to go up more. Maybe we'll change that to 30. Let's tab again. Now I got a picture where I can see both my linear function, my quadratic function, and where they intersect. And when I'm happy with that, just pressing enter will leave the window as it is set. So, so Adam, oftentimes my students will want to know where these intersect, these, these functions. Um, and we still have those features under menu. So let's go ahead and press menu again uh, and see, get some similar options to the calculator page, uh, but much, much more aligned with the graphs now. So we have actions under actions. Uh, attributes again, we can see the coordinates, equations, calculating. Under view, we can change the axes, the, the grid to be shown. Um, we can hide those axes and values that we we're playing with earlier. All those same options still exist. Uh, we have all our different function and graph types. There's that window zoom we talked about, very common, easy to go to. Um, our trace. Analyze graph, this is something I want to come back to. Intersection, uh, we could create a table. It would split the screen and we get a table that's associated with this graph that we're looking at. Um, we have geometry, so our graphs page is very much like a geometry page, just has the axes. Uh, and then the last one, settings. So let's go ahead and do an analyze graph and we'll calculate the intersection here. So I'm just using my touchpad. I'm using my finger and, and kind of moving along here and to the left of that first intersection. If I click once, gives me this scrolling window now. You see the intersection is highlighted. If I were to continue to keep going, now the intersection on the right is highlighted. So let's get that first one. I'll click. And it gives me the coordinates of where those two functions intersect. All right, let's do that one more time. Go to menu, analyze graph, intersection, click again, and get our second intersection. Um, so all the th same things you do on that handheld we're seeing very much exist here on the online version. In fact, if we go back to our calculator page, we could type in F1 and evaluate that first function, say for um, the intersection was about 343 thousandths. Let's go ahead and type in 343 thousandths for X and see if we get that Y value. So the functions, the variables that we have on pages are connected, right? So there's our 343 thousandths and about negative six and 97 hundredths. We're getting that value here on the calculator page. We could do the same thing for F2. We can evaluate F2 for really any value. It doesn't have to be the intersection points. So we'll say F2 or three, and it returns um, the evaluation of that function. All right, so, so Adam, we got a, a calculator page we've explored now. We have our um, graph app page we've explored. This isn't something I typically save, right? But I wanna show everybody how you, when you do have a page or a document that you wanna save, how you do that here. All right, so if we press doc and go to file, you'll notice save is grayed out. All right, so this is a difference with the handheld. You're not gonna be able to save directly to using that, that, that previous option. And that's because we're not saving to the handheld anymore. All right, so I'm going to get out of here. When we want to save, we're going to go up to document in the upper left-hand corner. We're going to save to our computer. And then you're going to type in exactly where you want to save that. All right, so I might give this a name of trial. I want to save it. We can just leave it in my downloads and we'll save that. And now I can pull that back up at any point um, that I'm on this computer, this device here, where that file is saved. All right, so one other thing I want to point out is on the handheld, you can open up um, files that have images on there. Uh, and on the software that you use um, that's downloaded to your computer, you can insert images. 
One thing you can't do yet at this moment in the online version that works off this Chrome browser is we can't insert an image uh, as a background on this page here. Um, you can upload files or open files to have those images already downloaded to them, but we can't go ahead and insert. So if I wanted to do it like, hey, I want to model uh, the path of a basketball here, I'd have to have that document created ahead of time, and I wouldn't be able to just go ahead and insert a, a picture right now into this background. Um, so let's go ahead and, and show how do you open up a document that's pre-created. So I'm going to go to document again. I'm going to open from the computer. And we talked about doing a geometry activity. So let's see if I can get our area formulas activity. There it is. I'm going to go ahead and press open on that. And you'll notice it's closed that previous document that we're working in. Um, it has one document open up at a time, all right? And so it'll automatically do that once you've saved. So this activity we're gonna explore here, Adam, in the last few minutes of this, this part of the, the webinar is around area formulas. Uh, this, I love this activity. It's one of the favorite ones to do with my students uh, where they get to explore how the area formulas for different polygons are connected and related. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at this one. There's a, uh, on the Math Inspired website, you can go ahead and pull up a student document that comes with this. I thought for tonight's purposes, we would just explore the TS file. All right, so they read this first page. To click to the next page, you can do that control click that you would normally do on the handheld, or you can go ahead and just click on 1.2 above there. All right, so on 1.2, we're seeing we have a rectangle. It says use the up arrows to show the dimension label. So I'll go ahead and click there. We get our height, our base, pretty straightforward. Let's move into 1.3, just clicking on that tab, like we mentioned earlier. You get the area of a parallelogram. And this time we're gonna explore that area of a parallelogram with the area of a rectangle that has the same base and same height. So when I wanna to get to the, my next page, I can click this blue arrow. And now you see they have that rectangle that they're most familiar with, right? They know the area formula for it. They can count the squares if they've forgotten and relearn that. Um, but now we bring in the parallelogram, not that common one. It's one my students typically forget. So bringing up this document, I think, helps them with that. So we're going to grab point H and we're going to move it up and down. And the way I'm going to do that, I'm just using my touchpad. I'm clicking and holding down. And we're going to move that up and down. We can grab, do the same thing with point B and move that around. And as I do that, you see the height and base stay the same between the two. So what we're about to learn works for a rectangle and parallelogram that have the same height and same base. All right, and the next thing we're gonna do is go ahead and grab point P. We're gonna pull it slowly to the right as far as I can. And we see we've transformed this parallelogram by cutting off that end triangle and have it, we see that it has the same area as a rectangle with the same height and same base. Super exciting when kids see that. They're like, oh, so what's the area formula? It's base multiplied by its height. That makes sense to them. All right, so we now know the formula for the area of a rectangle and the area of a parallelogram. Let's explore the area of a triangle. All right, so on the next page, we're gonna do something similar. We're gonna start by grabbing point H, click there once, and then click on point H, you can move that up and down, see what happens, and do the same for point B. Base and height remain the same as each other. All right, this next thing, we're gonna grab Point Q, I love this, absolutely love it. We have a triangle here, we have a parallelogram. How are they related, their area formulas? Grab point Q and we're gonna pull it up and over like a frown and we see, wow, I have two triangles now that are congruent. They have that same base, same height. It takes two of them and I get this parallelogram above. Um, so I know now the area of a triangle is half the area of a parallelogram, which we just learned was base times height. 
So how this activity kind of continues here, I'm just looking at time. Uh, you can continue to do the same thing, moving on to the trapezoid. Um, but I want to give people an idea of what it's like to open up a document that's pre-created and also explore creating your own documents from scratch. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this screen sharing over to you, Adam. All righty. All right, so I'll be able to share now. Just scroll down. Oops, there it is. All right, I'll ask you, Ed, Ed can you see what my screen now? I can. So we got three red, two blue, and choose three without replacement. Right. So I wanted to make sure because I figure if you can see it, everybody can see it. All right. What I, would, I thought I would do is Ed took the um, calculator page and the graphs page and introduced you. Obviously, you got to play with the area file. And I'm going to look at a list and spreadsheet page, um, data and statistics page, and kind of bring it all together with Python. What we're going to do is we're going to do a simulation of kind of the old classic either probability or counting problem, depending on how you want to think of it, where we have five marbles, three of them red, two blue. We're going to choose three of them without replacement. And we're going to run this experiment since we're going to use Python, a programming language. We're going to do it a whole lot of times. Now, let me just say here, obviously, is the theoretical probability. Um, you're, you're not going to dry, draw no reds because, I mean, you're drawing three and there's only two blues, so you can't get any. 30% chance to get one red, 60% chance to get two reds, and 10% chance to get three reds and as you draw the three. If I was doing this in a classroom, um, and by the way, this is a notes page, which is very nice for just displaying information. Um, if I was doing this classroom, I wouldn't start by giving them the theoretical probability, I'd probably start with the program. And I've started trying to do programs, um, started trying to do some Python programming in my math classes as a way to teach. I figure if somebody can program something, they understand it. Um, but anyhow, that's neither here nor there, but I'd probably start with the program, then talk about, okay, just talk to the students. How many different ways can you pick one? How many different ways can you pick two reds? How many different ways three? Then, if it's appropriate for the class, go to the combinations. But either way, here they are. I thought that was a good lead-in page for this. This is just a document we're going to construct most of it as we go. So let's add a page. And first one, like I said, I want to show you a list and spreadsheet page. Really very much in works like a regular spreadsheet, but it's called list and spreadsheet because if I put something in up here, so I'm going to put number, and we're going to use this for the number of reds that come up, well, sort of the number of possibilities. It's actually not the number of reds. And I know zero is not a possibility, but it works really nice when we get to the Python, so we're going to leave that there. One, two, and you could get three. And the, now, when I say it's a list, if I went to something else, if I opened a um, calculator page and typed the word number, it would show you zero, one, two, three. Those numbers have been saved under the name number. And we're gonna use red for actually the number of reds. And I didn't mean to hit anything there, so we'll come out here. And we'll do, let's just put the theoretical probabilities in. We're gonna do a simulation, like I said, in a minute, but. This one was 30, this one was 60, and this one's 10. Because if you don't have an experience with the Inspire, I think the list and spreadsheet page to store the data and then a data and statistics page to display it is just brilliant. So let's just add another page. We're going to add the data and statistics page. And when you come here, it just has everything jumbled up because you haven't declared what your variables are. We're going to put the number down here 
let it work as our independent variable. And right now, see, if you were just displaying regular data, this would be a brilliant way to do it. And it's not bad for what we're doing here. You can see zero, there's zero and 31. You know, you can put your cursor over and see it. But this to me is not the most natural way to display this data for what we're trying to do. So let's change this over. To do that, I need, oh, well, I need to right click, not just click. And I'm going to remove the Y variable and then put it back in as a summary list. In other words, it's going to handle it more like this is the number of times that the other column showed up. And now this still isn't the best display that we could have because it's looking at everything as a range. And really, we have very discrete possibilities. Either it came, the reds came up no times, which doesn't happen, one time, two times, or three times. So we'll change this again, and we're going to force it to be categorical. In other words, just represent those discrete numbers. And we get a pretty histogram here. Now, we'll tie all this together in a minute, but let me show you up here. If you went to menu, you can change it. I mean, a pie chart would also be a good way to represent it. But the pie chart's not all that great for what I want to do today, so we're going to go send it back to the bar chart or histogram. All right. So we got our pretty picture, nice in color, but we don't have a simulation because all we're doing is showing the theoretical data, which is nice, but not that great. So well, I guess I ought to show you one other thing before we move. One thing, as Ed was mentioning, the different pages are tied together. As long as you're in the same problem, and that would be here we're in problem one, you got 1 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3. Like if I made this 70 and came over here, now this has gone off the top of the page. And I can just grab if I want to and pull this down. Now, this is a ridiculous pull down, but it'll make sense later for what I'm doing. But still, and you could readjust it back. And I'll come over here. We'll just make it back to the theoretical, although we're going to get rid of this data when we actually start running the simulation. Now, as we do this, I guess we ought to actually put in, I said Python simulation, so we ought to put in Python page. And as we enter Python, and by the way, as I go through the program, I'm going to show you. If you're trying to keep up with it, that's great. But if you fall behind or just want to watch it, in the materials that we have for this um, webinar, I gave you this starting um, TNS file. I also gave you a completed file that has the completed program and a um, well, just a PDF with the full program on it. And we'll just call this, you know, for lack of creativity, pick three, because we're picking three things. And we have now our Python. Now, this is the Python editor. Really, Python's in two pieces, the editor and the shell. And we'll get to the shell in a minute. Now, as I start with this, we're going to just put in some of the main variables that we're going to use. We'll have others, but... Let's just start with red. And I'm going to let red equal, I'm going to represent this in a little bit of a strange way. Four times, use the close bracket, zero. Now let me show you what that does. All it's doing is really creating a list with four entries, and all of them are zero. I can run this very, well, nothing program at this point. If you do Control R, it'll run the program. Now nothing happened. But it brought us to the shell, and, well, something did happen. If I type a variable right after I've run the program, it'll show you what it is. So now we have it as 0, 0, 0. Well, one more 0. If we come back over here, if I bounce back to our spreadsheet, I want you to notice that none of these changed. So while all the pages are interconnected, the Python kind of sits on separate but we're going to be able to send this information back to the regular part of the Inspire within our program. It'll just be storing a list, and we'll get to that. 
But anyhow, so we just defined that we're going to use this to keep up with the count of how many times, you know, in the first slot, it'll be how many times zero. So that'll stay zero. How many one, times one showed up? How many times two showed up? And then the fourth one's how many times three showed up. All right, then we'll do total. And we'll do total equals five because we're going to draw five. I wouldn't really have to make this a variable, but if I chose to have more marbles represented in the bag, um, having the variable up here at the top is a convenient way to do this. And then from total, we'll also just put one more in run equals zero, because as we go through this, we'd really like, I want to keep up with how many times the simulation is run. And we'll use run to do that. All right. So that's our lead in, but now we need to set up what we want to do for this. And by the way, this is all going to tie back to those list and spreadsheet page and the data and statistics page when we finish this. All right, so we got this. And what we want to do is we want to have this run as many times as we want to, and then just stop when we press a key. Escape is a convenient key, and that's the one we're going to use. And we're going to use a while loop to do that. Now, if you were just doing a normal while loop, it would be under built-ins and then control. And here, built-ins control, you got your if-then statements, you got your, well, you can see them all. We got our for loop, which we'll use, we'll actually use an if statement, we'll use a for loop, and we got your while loop. But for today, we want to use a special view version of this, and it's under more modules, and it's under TI system. And we're going to use this sort of prepackaged. You could type all this in, but I like prepackaged. I don't have to do anything. <laughs> all right, so, well, I do have to do something that I'll get to in a minute. First, let me explain this. It's a while loop, so while get key is it's going to be looking every time the while loop runs, it's going to be looking to see if you press the key. The explanation mark equals is not equal. And then escape is literally your escape button on your computer or on the handheld for that matter. But um, so it's going to run. This loop will keep running until you hit the escape key, at which point it stops. This is a brilliant thing to do on this type of simulation or sometimes i mean it comes up a lot in programming and notice it says block that's where we're going to put all the code that runs in that while loop anything that's inside this while loop is spaced over that those diamonds are just spaces i mean if i did one more and wiped it out we don't want we want two and that'll be inside the while loop now we did something that i need to cover for now though not a bad thing, but a moment ago, we did menu, more module system. Anything except that first little built-in category I showed you, everything in the built-in is fine. You don't have to worry about it. But if you go to any of these other modules, system, random, those are the two we'll use, you have to import all the commands. So, it's in the import statements at the top of the menu for each of them. So what this does is it's telling the program, I want you to recognize, and we're importing all the commands under system. Python is designed to be kind of a really light program. So then you have to bring in the different commands that you're going to use outside of those built-ins. But now what we have will work just fine. So I guess now we'll just start building our experiment. As we build our experiment, I'm going to start by, let's count our run. You know, in other words, every time we go through, we want it to go up by one. Sort of the normal way you do this in programming is say run equals run plus one. In other words, it adds one to whatever run was before. That works great, and it works brilliantly in Python. Python has a shortcut that I'm very fond of, where you use plus equals one. 
and it does the same thing. Every time it comes by this line and hits that line, it's going to increase run by one. And now let's put in one more thing, and that is let's print what run it is, and then we'll run this. Now, print is under built-ins. That's one of the just normal little things. If you're guessing, it's input-output, and there's print. And then I can just put in uh, quotes. I want to say run equals, and then close the quotes, then comma run. There's fancier ways you can do this, but this will work brilliantly. Now, I'm going to run this, but I'm going to make an adjustment after we go with it. So let's just do control R again, which is what you use to run. What I don't like is, well, you got a whole page of runs. And well, it's going real fast because it's actually not doing anything. But let's come up here and put before the run. Let's clear our screen every time and it won't look quite as bad. And the way you would clear screen, and it takes some practice to know where these different commands are, but that's also a system command. And we just got to go far enough. Oh, there it is, clear history. And now if I run the same thing, it looks better, frankly. All right. Obviously going quickly, because like I said, we're not doing anything at this point. Now we're set up to actually build our experiment. And with our experiment, I am going to use RD, and that's going to be reds drawn. And as we get ready to go into actually doing our drawings, we want to start over every time the while loop goes. And so we're going to set it to zero. And if you want to, to you can put hashtag RD equals reds drawn. And that's just putting comments into the code. It doesn't make it run better, but sometimes it makes it more understandable. All right, once we got our red, our red drawn set to equal to zero, now we need to actually do our experiment. So we'll come down another page, and what we're going to do is we're going to run a for loop because we want this thing to run exactly three times. And that would be in built-ins, control, and this will work fine. We'll just do I and three. Because every time we're going to draw three balls out. Now, one thing, and I'm going to just do this in another comment. Whenever we use range, so we're going to say for range, three at e brilliant three i will equal zero one and two it's an important thing to know because this is a little bit different than most of the languages i've run into that whenever you're doing python it runs the range starts at zero it counts like any good mathematician does it's zero starting at zero that'll be advantageous to us as we go through this but it's something you always have to be aware of if you're using the program. Um, now, notice that our while loop is indented two times. Now we got another two spaces, and that's going to be for everything that's inside the while loop, but also inside the for loop. Now, as we do this, now we're in a position that we can draw a ball. And we'll draw one ball each time the for loop runs. So I'm going to just call it draw. Probably more imaginative names out there. And then we're going to go into the menu. In the classroom, I'd ask, well, what do you think if I want to pick a ball? Just, you know, don't want to be particular, but want to do it at random. Then they'll say, oh, well, maybe random. And we're going to pick a random integer. And that random, in random integer, oops, it jumped out of there. I don't know why, but okay. We'll go from one up to total. 
Because remember, at the beginning, we defined total to be 5, which is all we have. But we also need to add something else in here, and that would be we need to put in how big we need to adjust for the fact that we're drawing a ball. Because if you pull one out, there's only four left, so we'll do total minus i. See, this is where the zero helps us, because we come in here the first time, total is five. Second time we go, total is four. Third time, total is three when we do our drawing. Now we've picked one. If we're trying to count how many reds are drawn, next thing we got to do is figure out if a red was drawn or not, and that's an if statement. And, you know, so we go back up to built-ins, control, if. Now, the nice thing about this program, it keeps sending us exactly to the same places. Now, I forgot one thing, but we'll get to that in a moment. Um, and the part that I forgot and what I didn't do, here, let's go to Heck with a moment. Let's go ahead and do it now. I put in random. Random was from someplace besides built in. So, random, I need to come up here and import all the commands. If you forget this, it's not the worst thing in the world. What will happen, and I've done this more than I care to admit, um, if you forget those commands, you'll run it and it'll say, like when we came down here, it says, I don't know what random integer is. And you go, Oh, yeah, I need to put that in. All right, so now we need to decide if we drew a red. Well, for this, I'm going to make an assumption. I'm going to assume that, at least in the way that we're representing this, that the reds are the first three balls. So if your draw is less than or equal to three, then we would have drawn a red. And, but we have to do something else because once we draw a red, then there's less red. So this really wouldn't be how it is in the bag, but just how you represent it in the program. We'll subtract off how many reds are drawn. Now see, we're spaced two more spaces in. And what we need to do in here is just if we draw a red, we need to change the drawn red. And so we'll use the same thing we did, RD plus equals one. So every time a red is drawn, the number of reds will go up by one. Now at this point, really, we have the full drawing. All we need to do now is record after each sort of run of this. So we don't need to be in the if statement, so back off those two, and we don't need to be in the for because we've gone our three loops and basically recorded. So what we need to do now is we need to change our our red list, the thing we created at the beginning that's starting and just has four zeros in it right now. So we'll just do red. The way you identify one of those things, if I wanted to put something in the first one, I would do red one. Now this is not what I'm doing. But if I did that just as a command, that would be ever how many things are in there. In not the zero slot. Now, list also count zero, one, two. It starts on zero. So this would be kind of the second entry. But what we're going to do is have it put on how many red drawn. So in other words, if you went through the for loop, it drew two reds. Then what we want to do is increase the number that's represented in the slot that counts the two reds, we want to increase it by one. If it came up as one, this would then, RD would be one, it would increase the number that's there by one. And now, if we ran this right now, and we could, might as well, hopefully it didn't, unexpected indent. So I did something stupid. That's probably this thing. All right, let's try again. Now again, I don't have it showing anything. But if I type red, my numbers have climbed up. Now, I better finish this up. It didn't change over here, so I need to change over there. So let's do that. Put in two spaces. And we need to go back to our system 
and we'll do more modules system and then store list. This is what sends it back to the Inspire. The Inspire name, we called it red. I called it red here. I don't know if that's good programming habit, but oh well, I've done it that way. Now, if I run this program, we'll just run it a short amount. If I come back over here, the numbers have changed. Now, if we wanna make this just the best it can be, and this is where I'll finish up. Well, I guess I got one other thing after this, but real quickly, let's change. I'm gonna combine some things, page layout, and I'm gonna group them together. So there's this page and that page can be seen together, the shell and the histogram. And let's do one better. I don't really like that layout that much. Select layout. And I like layout three. And let's just scoot this up a little. Now, if I run this from the shell, what happens is the histogram changes as the run goes. And you can keep running this as long as you want to, but let's just stop there. But you can then also put them over here and you can see the number of each that came up and it changed back over in the original list. Last thing I wanted to show you, and I think I can do this in the two minutes that I have. If you wanna to go to Math Inspired or see any of the stuff online that, that can be used for with the Online Inspire or with Python, you can go just to the TI website, but a cheap way to get there is if you have this, just click on the question mark and visit resources. It'll bring you in here and there's activities. Math Inspired is right here. I can click on that. And for example, there's a ton of stuff in here under geometry. If you look down here, perimeter and area. And then here's what Ed went through, which is a wonderful activity. I'm glad he selected it because I liked seeing that one. Also under activities, if you want to learn more about Python, TI codes, click on Python and just kind of go from there. Click on Inspire and you can find out more. This is a great way to learn Python or TI Basic for that matter. But since I just did Python, I figured I'd mention that. All right, now I ought to be able to click off that. And I suppose it is time for me to send this back to Mike so he can finish this whole thing up. And I guess I need to stop sharing. And maybe I didn't want to do that because, okay, here, I'm going to share again because that's the only way I know to. Sorry, my in, my. I got it. We're, we're, we're good, it? Adam. Yep. Okay. Mike can take it on his own, which is good. Thanks so much, Adam and Ed, for everything you shared tonight. I'm really excited uh, to announce that we not only do we have a new TI online graphing calculator, uh, but we also have a Facebook community group uh, that is really run by you know educators like yourselves. Um, and so, if you'd like to learn more, feel free to uh, feel free to search for the TI Teacher Community Facebook group page. TI Teacher Community. Uh, again, it's just full of other educators that use TI technology. Um, and they're here to, whether you have questions or suggestions or uh, whatever you might want to talk about, um, it's a great resource uh, to use. As Ed mentioned, our lucky winner for tonight is Lori White. So Lori, congratulations. We'll be uh, reaching out to you to get some information about which TI graphing calculator you're going to pick. So start thinking. To receive a certificate of attendance, please click the link in the chat window. Also listed is a link for the documents as well for tonight. I know some people had asked about uh, some of the documents that Ed and Adam were using. Uh, that's there in that link. And if these documents or certificate links aren't working for any reason, uh, hang tight. You're automatically going to get a follow-up email in a couple days. And that follow-up email will contain links not only to the certificate and the documents, but also to the recording. So you can kind of go through this at your own pace. Uh, I know myself, I'm a very junior 
uh, entry level coder. So a lot of stuff that Adam was doing, I really would need to take a little bit slower. Uh, so I appreciate having the recording available to do that. And if you're watching this on demand, go ahead and copy that link into your favorite browser to receive your certificate. If you need to get a hold of us for any reason, uh, whether it be questions about our products or pricing, anything, feel free to give us a call at 1-800-TI-CARES or send us an email ti-cares at ti.com. We'd love to hear from you. So thanks so much, Adam and Ed, for everything you put together tonight. Uh, it's always exciting to see a new product, and I appreciate uh, you guys sharing that with us. Thanks for having us, Mike. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Yeah, we appreciate you being here. Thank you for letting us share with you. Absolutely, and we hope to see everyone back online next week. Have a great day.